Hey everyone, welcome to Cloud On Air, live webinars from Google Cloud. Uh, we've been hosting these webinars every Tuesday this February. My name is Kurt Enzinger, and I am a Google Cloud specialist that specializes in our productivity and collaboration tools. This afternoon, I'm going to be spending some time talking with you about different tips and tricks to get the most out of G Suite. You can ask questions anytime using the platform, and we have Googlers standing on by to help answer them. Sound good? All right, <clears throat> so the first stop in our tour today, we're going to be talking about Gmail. As you are all aware, Gmail is a pretty good application, um, and you're probably pretty familiar with how to use it, but the first thing that I'm going to show you is the search feature. So I think you all are familiar with the fact that you can type in a search term or you can type in a, an email and spend time looking through all of those, but what I want to do is sort of up-level your ability to do Google searches. So we're going to be working in a domain today called Onsited, and in this domain I've subscribed to a lot of rock climbing and mountaineering uh, different newsletters. So let's say we're going to look for a term called Belay. We've been able to pull up all these different emails that have Belay associated with them, but I need to do a little bit more searching. I want to dig in a little bit on this. If we come over here, this is what we call our advanced search options. We can click down into advanced search, and we see a whole other interface of ways to get more granular in the type of searching that we're doing. First thing that we'll see is we can choose the location that we're going to be doing our search. We can choose all mail, inbox. In this case, I'm going to look for unread mail. We have the ability to add a from field that will tell us who sent the email, we have the ability to search by who the email was sent to, as well as keywords in the subject, and also keywords anywhere in the email. In this case, we, we brought Belay over from our original search. You can also specify words that you don't want to be included in the message. So, for example, we don't want to talk about ice climbing today, so we're going to remove that. And then you have options to determine if there's attachments, or if there are chats available, as well as size and date. So, We'll click through this search, and we've gone from 23 different emails down to three, which is much more manageable. Gives you the ability to look through and, and, and use your emails more effectively. Now, that's pretty cool, but I think that um, many of you are probably wanna, wanna, gonna wanna be what we call power users of Gmail, right? So here's what I would recommend that you do if you'd like to be a Gmail power user. Open up a, and go to google.com and search for the term Gmail search operators. The first hit is a help article from our Gmail help pages. Bookmark this and then do your best to try and memorize these. There's a whole long list of search operators that you can use within Gmail to try and do more granular searches. So for example, if we come back to our inbox, let's say we want to see any emails that are unread that have been sent before January 1st of this year and has an attachment. Just with a simple set of search operators, we're able to get very specific on the types of emails that we're pulling up to search for, which gives you a lot of power in using Gmail. Awesome. So we've learned a little bit about advanced search, we've learned a little bit about search operators, but let's think of another way that we can get organized. And for that, I wanna share with you some information about labels. A label is something that you can be, that can be approximated as a folder, but with some key differences. Essentially, a label in Gmail is a different view of your mail environment that allows you to see different sets of data. Inbox, starred, sent mail, and drafts, those are all examples of default labels, but we have the ability to create our own labels. So if you notice over here, we've got a lot of messages coming from Rock and Ice Magazine. And since my boss doesn't really like it when I'm looking at rock climbing magazines on the job, we're gonna filter these out, we're gonna label them so that they're out of our way. So we'll create a new label, and we're gonna call this Rock and ice. If you notice here, we can nest this label underneath of another one. We can put it under newsletters, personal, anything we want, but just for the sake of 
ease, we're going to create its own top level label. And notice now over here on the right is a label called Rock and Ice. If we click on it right now, there's no conversations in here. We haven't labeled anything. Um, nothing really has happened yet. So we'll come back to our top level inbox. And there's a couple of different ways now that we can interact with this label. The first would be to take a message and drag it and drop it over into our label. That message has now been archived and it has the label rock and ice applied to it. So if we click in there, here's our rock and ice. We can also go the other direction. So let's say we can select a few of these and now we want to label these with rock and ice, but not archive them. We take rock and ice from our label set, we drop it on top and now they're all labeled rock and ice. The interesting thing about these, now if you click on to one of these and in, into one of these emails, you can see up at the top that it has the label rock and ice and it also has the label inbox because it lives in both of those worlds. To make labels even more useful, we can actually adjust the color. This is going to help it stand out and make it easier for you to see. So in this case, we'll turn this label into bright orange. There it is, orange up there, it's orange down here. And if we come back into our inbox, here are all the rock and ice labeled items. That's all well and good. You know, I've taught you how to create a label, how to change the color, how to drag and drop things, but you probably don't want to spend your entire day dragging and dropping emails back and forth, right? Well, good news. We're going to use something called a filter to try and help automate this process. A filter is going to start at the same place that the advanced search does. And in this case, we're going to filter out the emails that have the words rock and ice. So just the words rock and ice and nothing else. So we're going to put in a quotation. We'll type rock and ice, close quotation. This is going to ensure that we're looking for just that phrase and not for any, any email that has the word rock or any email that has the word ice because that could complicate things a bit. What we'll do from here before I create the filter is I actually just go through with the search and take a look and see to make sure that I'm not picking up anything unusual. Everything looks good. So we'll come back in and we're going to create a filter with this search. Now that we're in the uh, filter options here, there's a lot of things that we can do with it. We can skip the inbox, which we'll do in this case. You can mark it as read so that you don't even have to realize that it came in. I want to read it at some point, so I'll leave it. You can star it. You can apply the label. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to apply the label rock and ice. Then you could do things like forward it, delete it, send it to spam, make sure it's always marked important, all kinds of good stuff there. And you would hit create the filter. Now, once we hit create filter, any new email that matches this search will apply these rules. It'll skip the inbox it, it'll apply the label rock and ice, and it'll be good to go. But what about all these existing ones that are already there? I can simply check this box right here. Also apply filter to matching conversations. We create the filter, and now all of those are filtered out into rock and ice. Nice and easy, right? It gives you an automatic way to manage your inbox, to organize your labels, to, and we've also learned a little bit about how to do some searching. Awesome. Well, the next thing that we want to do, now that we've talked about ways that you can sort of automatically organize your emails, I like to spend time with our customers telling them about how to visually organize your inbox. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, the first thing that I like to show people is turning on and off conversation view. I've been a Gmail user for since it was in beta many, many years ago, so I love conversation view, but it's what I would call a polarizing setting, right? Either you love it or you hate it, and I want to give you the ability to turn it on and off depending on what suits you. A conversation in Google, just for those of you that may not be aware, is essentially where we take messages that are related together, usually by subject line, and we bundle them together. So here at the top is an example of a conversation. Might be a little confusing because I had the conversation with myself for demonstration purposes, but we can click into here and we can see that there are three different messages. First is the message that I sent, then a reply, and then another reply there. 
If you want to debundle these so that they don't exist together, you simply come into your settings and you go into settings again. Now at the top you'll notice there are a number of tabs for your settings. This one's going to live in the general area. About a third of the way down is conversation view. You turn conversation view off. And then this is key. When you're changing your settings in Gmail, make sure that you save changes. Awesome. So now you can see that that conversation bundle has been debundled and now it's two separate emails. So if you're not a fan of conversation view, you're welcome. I just totally changed your life. Um, the next thing that I like to show customers is uh, something called the preview pane. So a lot of people have lived in other mail clients where they have the ability to see their inbox on one side and a preview of the email on the other side. So we can do that in Gmail too. If we come to settings, we're going to go to a new tab now and this tab is called labs. Labs are experimental features that you can enable for Gmail. These labs are going to be controlled by your administrator. So not all of them that I'm showing you here may be available. Um, but that's going to be up to your admin to figure out. There's a lot of really great ones in here. Can responses, custom keyboard shortcuts. But the one that I want to show you is the preview pane. Again, click on enable. Don't forget to save your changes. And it's going to refresh our inbox for us. Looks the same right now, but you notice we have this new button up here. This is where we control our preview. So we can choose what type of split we want to use. I tend to like the vertical split. And now we have the ability to preview these messages without losing our inbox. You can simply click on your email and there it is on the right side panel. Pretty good stuff, right? The last thing that I like to show people in terms of organizing your physically organizing your inbox is what I call a priority inbox. So if we come back to our settings, within inbox, there are, there's something called an inbox type. Default inbox type is simply where your inbox will organize things in chronological order. The most recent email that comes in sits on top. But there's other ways that you can do that. You can do important first, where important emails surface to the top. You can do unread first, where any emails that you haven't read yet surface to the top. Starred first, similarly, anything that has a star. I like to do what's called the priority inbox. This is how I use my personal Gmail and how I use my, my work G Suite account. Priority inbox lets you have multiple sections as well as the ability to change and, and prioritize those as needed. So first will come important and unread, then will come starred. We can even add labels in here too. So we're gonna add a section. If we come into more options, here's our rock and ice and then everything else. Again, we'll save our changes. And notice that things have changed a little bit. Up here is important unread. A quick note about importance. Importance is a concept in Gmail that is a learning algorithm. As you mark things important or not important, based off of things like who sent the email, the content of the email, who's receiving the email, it will automatically determine what you, what you might think is important. So you can train your algorithm by marking things on and off and it'll get better over time. Here down is down here is what we have for starred. Then we've got our rock and ice and you can collapse these as needed. And here is everything else. The priority inbox is my favorite way to manage my inbox. It gives me the ability to surface the things that are important on red first. Then I use stars as some, some similar to a to-do list. And then everything else is stuff that I don't think is really that important anymore. Excellent. Now, a couple more things to show you in Gmail. The first one is actually my favorite setting in Gmail. It's called undo send. Let's say we're going to compose a message and we're sending a message to Albert Einstein because I work with him. And we're going to say, please review this information. I'm really excited. I'm sending Albert Einstein some info. So I'm going to say, hi, Bert. Please take a look below and give me your thoughts. But what happens when I get too excited and I accidentally just send it without finishing the email? 
Have you guys ever done that? You hit send and uh oh, what do I do? I've actually got this undo send button right here where I can click undo and I get my email back. I have the ability to finish it, slow down a little bit, proofread it, and then I can send it out again. In order to turn on undo send, you come into settings, under the general tab, about four or five down, we've got undo send. You enable that and you get to choose the cancellation period. I choose 30 seconds because sometimes I get a little bit confused and don't realize that I messed it up, but this is one of my favorite, favorite settings and it has saved me more times than I can count. The last thing that I'm gonna show you about Gmail before we move on is what we call Gmail shortcuts. So like I said, a lot of you probably wanna be Gmail power users. If you hit shift and question mark, it's gonna pull up all the different shortcuts that you can use to interact with the Gmail interface. The idea behind this is the less time you spend grabbing for your mouse and looking around and things like that, the less context switching that you do, the faster you're gonna be at composing emails, at being productive, right? So there's a lot of them there, you'll learn them over time. But for example, if we want to take a look at our starred messages, we can simply type G S and it will automatically pull up our starred messages. If we want to look at our labels, we can type G L and choose our rock and ice label. And here we are. If we want to go back to our inbox, we can type G and I, there's our inbox. And then if you wanted to compose a new message, you simply type D and there it does, it automatically brings up a new message for you. Again, the idea is we're gonna take seconds off of each task so that those seconds add up to minutes throughout the week, which adds up to hours throughout the months, so on and so forth. Awesome, so to review in Gmail, we've learned a little bit about searching, both advanced as well as super advanced with the search operators. We've learned about labels, we've learned about filtering, and then we've learned about how to visually organize your inbox in different ways. But I don't know about you, my life is controlled by my calendar, not by my inbox. So if it doesn't exist on my calendar, it's not real, it's not in my head. Um, so let's move over to calendar and look at some of the cool things we can do here. This right here is actually called the waffle. Uh, so you select the waffle and this gives you the opportunity to choose a new application. For those of you that are G Suite customers or use Gmail in your personal life, you've probably seen the new Gmail interface, or I'm sorry, the new calendar interface. But if you haven't, that's all right. Welcome to the new calendar interface. We'll start the, in here, the same place that we started in Gmail, and that's searching. You can, again, search by terms, but let's take a look at the advanced search options. This gives you a lot of really good ways to look through your events that are much more powerful. So we can look at different calendars, we can type in keywords, we can select organizers or participants, we can choose location or room, we can exclude keywords and then also the dates. Again, the idea is to make it easy for you to find what you're looking for. Now, the next thing I'm gonna show you is pretty interesting. I'm sure you're all aware of how to view a calendar of your coworker. You simply come into here, you can type in your coworker's name, select it, and now we can see that person's calendar overlaid with mine. But there's something called public calendars that are pretty interesting. If you click on the plus and add other calendars, you can browse calendars of interest. This is gonna give us a number of um, religious and regional holidays, a very long list of different regional holidays. So if you're working with a particular region very frequently, you can be up to date on their holidays. If you're a sports fan, it also has public sports calendars. I used to live in Chicago, so we can come into hockey, take a look at the NHL, select the Blackhawks, and we've added that calendar now. I can scroll down and I can see here are all the Blackhawks events. Pretty cool, right? Awesome. The next thing that I'd like to show you is what's called appointment slots. Imagine Tomorrow, I'm gonna to be meeting with a large number of customers, right? Six, seven, eight customers. And instead of emailing each one individually and trying to coordinate all the different times that are possible for me to meet with them, I'm gonna create an appointment slot, send everybody one link and let them determine when there's availability. So to do that, we're going to drag and drop. We'll do our appointments tomorrow from eight to noon. 
We're going to call this meetings with Kurt. And up here, we choose appointment slots. The next thing that we have to do is determine what our duration is going to be. We're going to make 30 second, 30 minute meetings and we'll save this. Now, instead of me having to coordinate with all these people, I can simply click on this calendar's appointment page, copy the link, and then send that link to a customer. If we were to, this is another environment that I have, if we were to put this in and give it to the customer, it's actually going to show a calendar interface where it overlays their calendar with all of these open appointments. And in order for that person to schedule a meeting with me, they simply have to click on one, fill out the information, and save it. That appointment's been booked, and if we go and look back at my original calendar, we should have a new appointment right here that we just scheduled, right? A really simple and easy way for you to, to minimize the amount of time that you're doing coordinating and shuffling times and all of that, just simply with calendar appointments. Next couple of things I wanna show you are small but, but powerful things. One is within the new calendar, you have the ability to restore deleted events in a very easy way. Let's say uh, I've got a proposal meeting tomorrow and I accidentally delete it thinking it was something else, not a problem. You simply come up to the settings, into trash, and here I can select and restore this event. And if we come back in just a moment, it should be restored. Nice and simple. The next one is what I call invisible events. Imagine on Thursday morning, I'm gonna go rock climbing for the morning instead of coming into the office. I don't want my boss to know that I'm out rock climbing, but I also don't want him to see that do not schedule block, right? So we'll call this rock climbing and we're gonna come into more options. If I mark it as private, it'll still show up on my calendar as an event, but, no, but nobody can see the details. But if I mark it as private and I change my status to free, then it won't show up on anybody else's calendar and I'll be the only one that can see it, effectively making it an invisible event. Pretty, pretty, pretty good stuff there. Last two things are, are new settings in, in calendar that I think are worth taking note of. On the left here, we have our time for our schedule. You have the ability to have a second time zone displayed. So if we come into our settings, under time zones, you can display a second time zone. I'm frequently working with Mountain View where uh, Google's headquarters is. So I'm gonna have that be my second time zone. Now we come back and automatically, as I'm scheduling things, as I'm building out my, my calendar for the week, I can easily see what the time is in Mountain View. And then another thing that's really great is what's called working hours. So I'm very protective of my work-life balance. So within our settings, I've set working hours such that when people try to invite me from Monday through Friday, outside of the hours from 9 to 6 p.m., they'll actually receive a warning. And that warning will say, are you sure you want to schedule it at this time? This is outside of Kurt's working hours. Pretty, pretty good stuff. Some of you may not have the, the luxury of being able to, to schedule those working hours, but if you do, I highly recommend it. Although what I found is that it hasn't really kept anybody from scheduling outside of those hours anyway. Oh well. Last thing in Google Calendar, similar to how we have shortcuts in Gmail, we have a large number of shortcuts in Google Calendar. And so with this the, the press of a button, you can do things like change the view. If we would rather see a day view versus a week view versus a month view. You also have a custom view, which in this case I've set to three days. Uh, and you can also select on the side and choose your own custom view. If I wanted to do a four day view, you can select on this calendar the four day view and then it'll maintain that as you scroll through different time periods. Excellent. We've talked a lot about Calendar, we've talked about Gmail. Let's spend a few minutes in Google Drive and Docs. So within Google Drive, there's a couple of interesting things to show you. Again, we have an advanced search feature, which gives you a lot of really robust ways to search through your data. Uh, we, the next thing is a extension that I think everybody should, should be using. 
It's called the Office Editing for Docs extension. If you search for that and pull it up in Chrome, this gives you the ability to edit Office Docs in their native format while in Google. Really highly recommend it because we recognize here at Google that oftentimes you're not gonna be working with somebody else in Google's environment, and so you need to have the ability to edit those documents. If we take a look at a Google, if we take a look at a um, document that is not a Google formatted document, you also have the ability to do versioning as well. So within a Google Doc, I'm sure you're aware, you can click on revision history and see every change that you've made. You can do something similar to that with a, within Google Drive. So if you select, this is a Word document here, if you select that and you click on view details, you come into details down here in the bottom right, gives you the ability to manage versions. We can see all the different versions that we've had. I edited it at 11.11, and you can see all the different versions all the way back to when it was created in 2014. This is an old one. You can upload new versions. You can also download or delete particular versions. Something that a lot of people don't recognize when they're dealing with other formatted types. Within Google Drive as well, there's something called Quick Access. So Quick Access is a setting that you can turn on under Suggestions, which will actually take into account when you last opened a document, what things are on your schedule, and will allow you to, and will automatically surface the things that it thinks you're gonna work on most often, which is a great feature as well. Excellent, we've talked a little bit about versioning. Uh, we've talked a little bit about how to edit Microsoft documents in Drive. Next, let's step into a Google Sheet and show you some of the really cool things that are coming out for that. So if we come into our folder here, I have a new sheet, it's called Black Friday Week Sales Data. So it's from this past Black Friday. And what I wanna do is, well, first of all, it's a little bit hard to see. There's, you know, it's not formatted well. So let's do a little bit of quick formatting to make it easier to see. The first thing that we're gonna do, we'll select everything. If we go into format, alternating colors, this is a really quick and easy way to just add some color to the, the document to make it easier to read. We can also do something called freezing. So if we go into view, we freeze our first row, and now as we scroll down, the title, pay, the title row stays with it to make it easier to see what all these numbers are. That's all pretty awesome, but what I really wanna do is get some insight from this data. We have this new feature called Explore. The Explore feature will give us the ability to do some really interesting things. It's powered by some, some awesome AI, and the first thing you'll notice is that it gives us an automatic suggestion for a pivot table. And then in this case, the pivot table displays average of unit price for each item. Really useful if you had to build that pivot table on your own, might take you some time, you can simply just click and add that in. It also does some initial analysis, in this case, cost of goods versus profit, and you can scroll through and see which ones you find interesting, and then in order to add it, you simply click insert chart, and there we go, with the click of a button, we've got a count of items graph here. Pretty useful, but let's say we want even more data, we wanna learn even more about it. If we come to back to our explore function, we can actually ask natural language questions of this feature and get answers back. So let's say we wanna know what item has the highest profit margin. It actually understands that question as top item by profit margin, which in this case was the watch with a profit margin of 0 0.6. And we can click in even further and see the query that it used to figure that out, which I'm pretty decent with uh, Google Sheets, but would have taken me quite a while to figure that out. Awesome. Another really interesting thing about Google Sheets is you have the ability to turn on notifications in the event that somebody edits the document. So if we come into Tools, Notification Rules, you can choose Notify Me at my email address. Anytime changes are made, 
And you can do it either in a daily digest, digest or email right away. We click save and now anytime somebody adds data to this, I'll be able to, to recognize it and see the new data. Pretty good stuff. So let's review all that we've seen today. We've seen quite a bit. We've talked about Gmail. We've talked about how to search and organize your inbox. We've talked about calendar and some of the cool tricks with new calendar in order to manage your, your days and times, especially appointment slots. We've talked about Google Drive and how to work with some files that aren't Google file types in Google Drive, both through versioning as well as um, through the extension. And then we've talked a little bit about Google Sheets and some of the excellent new features that are coming into Google Sheets around Explore and formatting and things along those lines. So that's all everything that I wanted to show you for this demo today. We're gonna take some live questions. Uh, so stay tuned for that and we'll be back in less than a minute. All right, welcome back everyone. Thanks for sticking with us. We're gonna go through a couple of questions that came up. Um, before I get started on those, we noticed that a, quite a few of the questions that came in were about product roadmap. I just wanna give you all a little bit of a, a heads up. If you are asking about product roadmap and you're a current customer, please feel free to reach out to your Google account manager and they can help you walk through the product roadmap for both G Suite and Google Cloud. If you're a prospective customer and you're interested in learning more about our product note roadmap, please go and visit the Google, Google Cloud blog where we'll make all public announcements. Awesome. So we've got five questions here that uh, we can potentially address today. 
Um, the first is whether the company is the ultimate owner of data for every user in G Suite. That's absolutely correct. When you're putting your data into G Suite, Google identifies that you are the owner of that data and Google is what's called a data processor, meaning that at any time you have the ability to remove that data from Google. We don't use that data for advertisements. We don't use that data for improving our products. We don't use that data for selling. We don't do anything with it. It's your data. But thanks for asking. Um, regarding Google Vault, if I enable Vault for an organization and set the retention period to undefined, if an employee leaves the company and I delete his or her account, can I browse and export a specific file of this user? So this is an interesting question. Um, for undefined, I think you probably meant uh, indefinite, which means you would keep that data forever. But there's a, there's a particular caveat here. When you're using Google Vault and you have a user that stored data there, whether it's in a legal hold or whether it's in um, just the normal retention period, if you delete that user, that data is no longer around, right? And so what you wanna do, there's a couple of different options. If you're going to be deleting a user and you wanna save that data, I would recommend doing the export prior to deleting the user. There are a couple other options and if this is a, an important um, part of the, the, pro, the platform for you, please reach out to your Google account manager and we can talk a little bit more about the details. All right, can we put Google Drive files Google Drive documents into labels instead of putting them in folders. In that case, what happens if the folders are shared? So at this point, Google Drive, the files that we store in Google Drive have limited metadata. You have the ability to look at the metadata that is there and add a small description, but the concept of labels don't actually exist at this point in Google Drive. So if that's something that you're looking for in terms of functionality, we have a number of third-party uh, app third-party providers that can add that type of functionality. One would be Power Tools, another would be AO Docs. Those are both um, third-party platforms that are built on top of Google Drive that help you with your sort of um, content management, CMS type of, of needs. Can people book appointments with calendar appointments if they don't have a Google account? They can book appointments with calendar appointment slots. The difference being is that it's not going to show them an example of their calendar. It will just give them the opportunity to book the slot and then they would have to manage the calendar appointment in their own calendar. Finally, the ever popular question, can we turn off conversation mode on mobile or iOS? And at this point, it is not possible. Unfortunately, you're stuck with conver conversation mode in, in your mobile device. Unless, of course, you choose to use the native iOS mail application in which case you would need to have access from your administrator to do IMAP mapping for your Gmail account. Excellent. Those are all the questions that we've got for, for you today. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Please be sure to tune in next week for more information about Google Cloud. Appreciate everybody's time.